Some people deny that American workers' incomes have risen at all in recent times. Such claims require a careful scrutiny of statistics. Here again, there are heated disputes over very basic facts that are readily documented in statistics. A Washington Post editorial, for example, said that in a quarter of a century, from 1980 to 2004, the wages of the typical worker actually fell slightly. Many others, writing in similarly prominent publications and in books, have repeated similar claims over the years. But economist Alan Reynolds, referring to those very same years, said real consumption per person increased 74 percent. And others have likewise categorically rejected the claims that workers' incomes have not risen. Such complete contrasts and contradictions have been common on this issue, with both sides citing official statistics. Here, as elsewhere, we cannot simply accept blanket assertions that statistics prove one thing or another without scrutinizing the definitions used and noting what things have been included and excluded when compiling numbers. In the case of statistics claiming that workers' incomes have not risen significantly or at all over the years, these data exclude the value of job benefits such as health insurance, retirement benefits, and the like, which have been a growing share of employee compensation over the years. Moreover, workers lump together both full-time and part-time employees and part-timers have been a growing proportion of all workers. Part-time workers receive lower weekly pay than full-time workers, both because they work fewer hours and because they are usually paid less per hour. In short, the weekly earnings of part-time workers drag down the statistical average of workers as a group, even though part-timers' work adds to both national output and to their own families' incomes. It is not that full-time workers are paid less than before, but that more part-time workers' earnings are being averaged in with theirs statistically. Thus, increased prosperity can be represented statistically as stagnating worker compensation, because average weekly pay as of 2003 is very similar to what it was 30 years earlier. The difference is that the average weekly hours have declined over that span of time, due to more part-time workers being included in the statistics, and because more of workers' compensation is now being taken in the form of health insurance, retirement benefits, and the like. Even so, the money income of full-time wage and salary workers increased between 1980 and 2004, and so did real income, either by 13% or 17%, depending on which price index is used. Counting health and retirement benefits, worker compensation rose by nearly a third between 1980 and 2004, even though this still excludes the statistically invisible returns inside IRA and 401k plans. The way real income is computed tends to understate its growth over time. Since real income is simply money income divided by some price index to take account of inflation, everything depends on the accuracy and validity of such indexes. The construction and use of these indexes is by no means an exact science. Many leading economists regard the consumer price index, for example, as inherently, even if unintentionally, exaggerating inflation. To the extent that the price index overestimates inflation, it underestimates real income. The inflationary bias of the consumer price index results from the fact that it counts the prices of a given collection of goods over time, while those goods are themselves changing over time. For example, the price of automobiles is increasing, but so are the features of these automobiles, with today's cars routinely including air conditioning, stereos, and many other features that were once confined to luxury vehicles. Therefore, not all the rise in the price of automobiles is simply inflation. 
If Chevrolets today contain many features once confined to Cadillacs, the rise in the price of Chevrolets over the years to become similar to the price of Cadillacs in the past is not all inflation. When similar cars cost similar prices, that is not inflation just because the cars had different names in different eras. Another inflationary bias to the consumer price index is that it counts only those things that most people are likely to buy. Reasonable as that might seem, what people will buy obviously depends on the price. So new products that are very expensive do not get included in the index until after their prices come down to a level where most people can afford them, as typically happens over time so that things like laptop computers and video cassette recorders that were once luxuries of the rich have now become readily affordable to vastly larger numbers of people. What this means statistically is that price increases and price decreases over time are not equally reflected in the consumer price index. How much difference does this make in estimating real incomes over time? If a price index estimates 3% inflation and statistics on money income are reduced accordingly to get real income, then if a more realistic estimate is 2%, that one percentage point difference can have very serious effects on the resulting statistics on real income. The cumulative effect of a difference of one percentage point per year over a period of 25 years has been estimated to statistically reduce the real annual income of an average American by nearly $9,000 at the end of a quarter century. That is yet another contribution to the fallacy of stagnating real incomes, even when those incomes are rising. One of the perennial fallacies is that the jobs being lost in the American economy, whether to foreign competition or to technological change, are high wage, and the new jobs being created are low wage jobs, flipping hamburgers being a frequent example. But seven out of ten new jobs created between 1993 and 1996 paid wages above the national average. Economist Alan Reynolds used consumption data as the most realistic indicator of living standards and found that consumption in real terms had increased 74% over the period during which workers' pay had supposedly stagnated. There are other more technical fallacies involved in generating statistics that are widely cited to support claims that workers' pay has stagnated. But we have already seen enough to get a general idea of what is wrong with those statistics. Why so many people have been so eager to accept and repeat the dire conclusions reached is another question that goes beyond the realm of economics.